Chapter 36 The Nibelungen Tragedy Kriemhild weds Etzel her desire for vengeance the festival invitation to Gunther and his knights Hagen's bravery the doom journey Dietrich and Hildebrand how the guests were received treachery of the queen scene. At banquet its tragic ending Dietrich intervenes hall in flames unconquered heroes Gunther and Hagen overcome gladness ends in grief. It fell that thirteen years after Siegfried's death Queen Helche of the Huns died, and King Etzel 114, who was a heathen, sought another bride. Rudiger, the rich Margrave, surnamed the Good, was sent as envoy to Worms to win Kriemhild. Whereat Gunther was made glad, because Etzel was a mighty monarch, but Grim Hagen grew angry, fearing that the widow of Siegfried would stir up enmity against them. Kriemhild ceased not to grieve for him whom she had loved, but her brothers and Queen Ut urged her to be wed to the mighty monarch of the Huns, and at length she gave her consent. Then sent she to Hagen for the Nibelung treasure, which she desired to distribute among the Hun warriors, but he refused to give it up saying, She shall not give it unto those who are my foemen. Kriemhild was made wroth thereat. Yet had she a portion of the treasure left, and she gave great gifts to the knights who came with Rudiger. The widowed bride had lost not her great beauty despite her long and deep sorrow, and when she came to the court of Etzel, the courtiers vowed that she was even more fair than was Queen Helche. She kissed the king, and when she was wed she was kissed by twelve noble knights, among whom was Blodel, the brother of Etzel, and the great warrior king, Dietrich of Bern, who had taken refuge at Etzel's court when his uncle, Ermenrich, had by treacherous doings possessed himself of the kingdom of the Aemlungs. So it came that Kriemhild had friendship and service from many strong war men. Great was her power. All the treasure that Hagen had left her she gave to the knights, and at length she said unto herself. Now am I made powerful, and can strike against the enemies of Siegfried, for whom my heart still calleth. As the days went past, and the years, her desire for vengeance grew stronger. There was not a Hun knight who would not do her willing service. Yet none did conceive of her fierce intent. A son was born to King Etzel, and his name was Ortlieb. Like was he in countenance to fair Kriemhild, and the king loved her more dearly because of her child. So at length when she craved of him a boon he said that he would grant it willingly. And the queen besought him that he should send envoys to Worms and invite, unto a festival at his court, Gunther and all his knights. As she desired, so was it done. Kriemhild spoke in secret to the envoys and bade them not to leave Hagen behind. Gunther received the message gladly, nor suspected aught of Kriemhild's evil desire, but Hagen warned the king in council with his knights, saying, We dare not go from here unto the court of Etzel. Our lives ain't in peril, for Kriemhild forgets not who slew her husband Siegfried. Her memory is long. Thereupon Gunther's brothers taunted Hagen. Thou knowest thine own guilt, one said, therefore thou hast need to protect thyself well. Twere better thou didst remain at Worms, while those who fear not sojourn among the Huns. Hagen was made wroth. No man among you feareth less to venture forth than I do, and with thee shall I go if ye are determined to visit the court of Etzel. So it was arranged that they should set out forthwith, and Hagen spake after that of their journey as, the death ride. Queen Ute had great desire that her sons should tarry in the kingdom. I have dreamt an evil dream, she said. Methought that all the birds in fair Burgundy were slain. He who is led by dreams, said Hagen, is without honor and no hero. Let us unto the festival of Kriemhild. Many women wept when they set forth. With Gunther rode a thousand and sixty knights, and his army did number full nine thousand men. When they reached the Danube River they found it to be high and running swift. Hagen sought for the ferryman, who desired not to take them across unless he were given rich reward. While searching, he saw bathing in a brook certain water fairies. He went stealthily towards them and possessed himself of their vestments. They had need, therefore, to make known to the fierce knight how he and all who were with him would fare upon their journey. One did promise that they would prosper and win great honor, but another said, "'Twere better to turn back. Ye are all doomed. Who rideth unto the court of Etzel rideth to death. Nor shall one return again unto worms save the priest. 
Then Hagen met with the ferryman and slew him for his boldness. He seized the boat, and, returning unto Gunther, he ferried across the knights and all their followers. As he crossed with the last company of men he beheld the priest among them, and remembering the prophecy of the water ferry, he seized him there and flung him overboard. But, although the man could not swim, he was driven over the waves and reached the shore in safety. When Hagen saw that the priest could return unto Burgundy, he knew that the foretelling of the water fairy was true, and said unto himself, These, our warriors, are all dead men. When they landed, Hagen splintered the boat in pieces. He was resolute indeed, and made certain that no man should turn back. The Bavarians came against them to avenge the ferryman's death, but they were beaten back, and Gunther and his war men marched forward until they came unto Beckleran. Where Rudiger the Good gave them generous and hospitable entertainment and many gifts. Tidings of their approach were borne unto Kriemhild. The day of reckoning is at hand, she said unto herself. Fain would I now slay the man who did destroy my happiness. He shall pay dearly because that he hath made me to sorrow. Aged Hildebrand spake unto Dietrich of Bern of the coming of the Burgundians, and counseled that he should ride forth to greet them. Hagen was a dear war friend to Dietrich aforetime, and there was good will. Betwixt them. So the fierce knight of Burgundy gave his friend warm greetings. Dietrich was made glad, yet did he inwardly grieve, when he beheld the warriors from Worms. Know ye not, he said, that Kriemhild hath ceased not to sorrow for Siegfried? This very day I did hear her lamenting because that he was dead. Gunther reasoned that Etzel had bidden them thither with right royal welcome, and that Kriemhild had also sent warm greetings, but Hagen knew well that sorrow awaited them. The Hun king knew not that his queen plotted against his guests, and his welcome was hearty and frank, but Kriemhild was haughty and cold. She kissed but her brother Giselher, who had no part in Siegfried's death. Unto Hagen she spake, saying, Hast thou brought hither the hoard of the Nibelungs which thou didst rob from me? Hagen answered, I have touched it not. It is hidden below the Rhine waters. There shall it lie until the day of judgment. So thou hast brought it not, she said coldly. Many a day have I grieved for it, and for the noble knight whose possession it was. I have brought but my weapons and my armor, said Hagen defiantly. I need not gold, Kriemhild sighed. But I would fain have recompense for murder and robbery. Then were the Burgundians, at the queen's desire, asked to lay down their arms. But Hagen made refusal for himself and the others, saying that it was the custom of the Burgundians to be fully armed on the first three days of a festival. It chanced that soon afterwards Kriemhild urged certain of her knights to slay Hagen. But they forbore, fearing as they did his dark brows and quick flashing eyes. When night fell the guests were conducted to their dwelling. Grim Hagen and Volker, the minstrel, fearing the treachery of Kriemhild, sought not to take rest. They clad themselves in their bright armor. Then they took their swords and shields and stood outside the door to guard their companions. After a time Volker took his fiddle, and, sitting upon a stone within the porch, he played merry airs which gladdened the hearts of those who were within, and they forgot their anxieties. Then he gave them soothing music and sweet, so that they were lulled to sleep. Thereafter he took up his shield again and stood beside Hagen at the door to guard the Burgundians against Kriemhild's war men. In the midst of the night the fierce Huns made stealthy approach, but when they beheld the knights keeping guard they turned away. Volker desired to challenge them to combat, but Hagen forbade him, and Volker cried out to the followers of Kriemhild, Cowards, would ye venture hither to slay men in their sleep? They answered him not. Kriemhild grieved because that her plan had failed, but she ceased not to plot against the guests. A tournament was held in Etzel's courtyard, and Volker slew a Hun warrior. But for the king, vengeance would have been taken for that cause. He hath been slain without intent, Etzel said, let my guests go forth unharmed. Kriemhild then spake to Dietrich of Bern and old Hildebrand, beseeching their aid to encompass the death of Hagen. Hildebrand answered, One man is not sufficient to overcome him. And Dietrich, answering her, said, Speak not of this again, O queen, 
I pray thee. These, thy kinsmen, have never done aught against me. Twill bring thee shame if thou dost any hurt to them, because they are now thy guests. It is not for me to avenge the death of Siegfried. Thereafter did Kriemhild plead with Blodel, King Etzel's brother, making him promise of rich reward, and he promised to achieve her purpose. He went forth to attack Gunther's men with a thousand of his followers. Dankwart was in command when Blodel fell upon them without warning, and fierce was the conflict. Meanwhile Gunther and Hagen and other knights sat at feast with King Etzel. Kriemhild caused her son Ortlieb to enter and sit nigh to Hagen, and the king said, Lo! Here cometh my only son to be among his kinsmen. Hagen loved not the lad. He hath a weak face, he said. I could never be a guest at his court. Suddenly Dankwart rushed into the feasting hall. He alone of all the war men had escaped the sword of Blodel, whom he slew, his body was red with the blood of foemen. Why dost thou tarry thus, brother Hagen, he cried. Our men are slaughtered in their dwelling. Guard the door, cried Hagen, and seizing his sword be smote off the head of Prince Ortlieb before his father's eyes. Then he slew the lad's tutor and cut off the right hand of a minstrel who had borne Kriemhild's message unto worms. Volker drew his blade also and made slaughter. In vain did the three kings, Etzel and Gunther and Dietrich, make endeavor to subdue the fray. Many Hun knights were slain, for the Burgundians were seized with battle fury and sought dire vengeance. They cut their way up and down the hall, and there was none who could stand against them. Then did Kriemhild plead with Dietrich of Bern, beseeching his aid, what time he watched, standing upon a bench, the doughty deeds of his old war comrade Hagen. Save me and King Etzel from this our dire peril, cried the queen. I can but try, Dietrich answered. Not for many years have I beheld such fierce fighting. Then he uttered forth a great shout, and his voice was like to the blast of a war horn. Gunther heard him, and called upon his men to pause in the fray. Mayhap, he said, we have slain knights of Dietrich. No harm have ye done me or mine, Dietrich said, but I ask of thee that I and those with me may have thy permission to go forth in safety. Thy wish is granted, answered Gunther. Then did Dietrich clasp the fainting Queen Kriemhild with one arm and took King Etzel's with the other. Thus did he leave the hall with six hundred of his knights. Rudiger went also with five hundred. Neither sought to take part in the fray. Thereafter was the conflict waged again with great fury, nor did it pause until not a Hun was left alive in the hall. The Burgundians rested a while, then they threw out the bodies of their foemen. Kinsmen of the slain mourned greatly. King Etzel seized his shield and desired them to combat against the stranger at the head of his men, but Kriemhild warned him that he could not withstand the blows of fierce Hagen. But his knights had to hold him back by force, and, seeing this, Hagen taunted the king. The darling of Siegfried and her new husband are faint-hearted, he cried. Ha, Etzel! Siegfried had thy lady to wife before thee. I slew him. Why, then, shouldst thou be angry with me? Kriemhild heard with anger. Much gold shall I give, and castles and land, said the queen, unto the knight who shall slay Hagen. Volker shouted defiantly, Never before beheld I so many timorous knights. Cowards all! Ye have taken of the king's substance and in his hour of trial ye desert him. I cry shame upon ye all. Many bold warriors rushed against the knights of Burgundy. Stranger knights who were there fought also. The nimble iring of Denmark struck mighty blows, and in the end he wounded Hagen. Queen Kriemhild praised him when he returned weary from the fray, and prompted him to return again. When he renewed the conflict, however, Hagen slew him. So fell many brave men, and the long summer day ended and darkness fell. The tumult ceased. Then the Burgundians besought King Etzel that they should be permitted to leave the hall and fight in battle, but Kriemhild forbade it. Her brother Giselher spake to the vengeful queen saying, I deserve not death at thy hands. I was ever faithful unto thee. I came hither because that I did bear thee love and thou didst invite me. Thou must needs now show mercy unto us. 
Can I show mercy who hath never received it? She answered him. The vile Hagen slew my child, so those who stand by him must suffer with him. But this I shall promise thee if Hagen be now delivered up a truce will be granted forthwith. Jernot answered, Never shall thy wish be granted. Rather would we die than ransom our lives with a single night. Then must we die indeed like to brave men, Giselher said. My brother Hagen is not without friends, cried Dankwart, ye who have refused quarter shall not receive it. Not at our hands. In the midst of the night Creamhild bade her, followers to set fire to the hall. That they did right gladly. The flames raged furiously, and one of them within cried, Woe is me! We are doomed to die. Rather would I have fallen in battle. Great was the heat, and the knights were tortured with thirst. Then did Hagen bid one of them to drink the blood of the slain warmen. One who suffered much knelt beside a corpse and drank the blood. The draught made him strong again. Better is it than wine, he said. The others did likewise, and were all refreshed so that they were able to endure their sufferings amidst the flames. Burning faggots fell upon them, but they protected themselves with their shields. Terrible was the heat. Never again shall heroes suffer as did these that night. Stand close to the walls, Hagen commanded, your armor shall protect ye. Let the blood quench the flaming brands. When morning broke, the Huns wondered greatly to behold Hagen and Volker again standing on guard at the hall door. Fierce attack was again made by the Huns, but they were beaten back. Nor did the conflict have pause until the last of Etzel's great knights was slain. Then did Kriemhild and the king make appeal to Rudiger to aid them, but he desired not to attack the brave Burgundians. Shall I slay those whom I did entertain in my own house, he exclaimed. I forget not past friendship. Yet was he constrained to fight, and he mourned his lot with the Burgundians. Would that I had a strong shield like thee, Hagen said. Mine own is hewn and battered sore. Rudiger gave Hagen his own shield ere he fought at Etzel's command with those whom he loved. Fierce was the conflict and long, and in the end Jernot and Rudiger slew one another. Then did Wolfhart, the bold knight of Bern, lead on the followers of Dietrich to avenge the death of Rudiger. One by one they were cut down by Gunther's heroes, save Hildebrand, who slew Volker. But Hagen made vengeful attack and wounded him. The old warrior fled. He hastened unto Dietrich, and cried, All our men are slain, and of the Burgundians but Gunther and Hagen remain alive. Dietrich was wroth. He sorrowed for his brave knights. No longer could he withhold from the fray. So he put on his armor and went unto the hall. He first bade Gunther and Hagen to surrender, but they defied him. Dietrich drew his sword and fell upon Hagen, whom he speedily wounded. Battle-weary art thou, Dietrich cried. I shall slay thee not. As he spake thus he caught Hagen in his arms and overpowered him. So was the valiant hero taken captive. Dietrich led him bound before Queen Kriemhild, and her heart rejoiced. Now is all my sorrow requited, she said, thee, Dietrich, shall I thank until my life hath end. The Prince of Bern said, Slay him not. He may yet serve thee, and thus make good the evil he hath done. Hagen was cast into a dark dungeon, there to await his doom. Dietrich then fought against Gunther, who was more fierce than Hagen had been. Indeed he came nigh to slaying Dietrich. But he was at length borne down, and taken prisoner and bound. When the king of Burgundy was taken before Kriemhild, she said, I welcome thee, O Gunther. He answered her, If thy welcome were made with love, I would thank ye, but I know well that thou dost mock. Dietrich pleaded with the queen that Gunther and Hagen should be spared, but his words fell upon ears that heard not. Kriemhild went unto Hagen and demanded that he should return unto her the treasure he had stolen. The knight answered her, Vows I took not to reveal where the hoard is hidden so long as my king liveth. Then did the queen command that her brother should be slain. With her own white hand she held high by the hair before Hagen the dripping head of Gunther. Now all thy brothers are dead, Hagen cried. 
Where the treasure is concealed is known but to God and myself alone. Thou devil, thou shalt never possess it. So wroth was Kriemhild that she seized a sword and smote off the head of Hagen. Alas, cried King Etzel, the boldest knight who ever fought in battle hath fallen by a woman's hand. Old Hildebrand, recking not what would happen him, drew his sword and smote the queen. A loud cry broke from her lips, and ere long Kriemhild died. So ended the festival of King Etzel, as gladness must ever end in grief. What befell thereafter I can tell not. Knights and soldiers, wives and maids, were seen weeping, and heard lamenting for their friends. So ends the Nibelungenlied. Minstrels, singing the sorrowful lay of the death of Siegfried, and the fall of the Nibelungs, have told that Queen Brunhild and Queen Ute sat side by side embroidering on tapestry the death of Balder. Again and again did Brunhild say to the mother of Gunther, Each time I picture Balder, his face grows like unto that of Siegfried. Soon tidings were brought to them of the death of Gunther and all his men. Brunhild wept not. She went out into the darkness, nor ever returned again. When search was made, she was found lying dead in the grave mound of Siegfried, whom she had loved. Chapter 37 Dietrich of Bern Hildebrand's pupil Alberich the dwarf Grimm and Hilda the magic sword conflict in the cavern giant and hag are slain great Sijnot Dietrich taken prisoner in the dragon's lair Hildebrand put to shame giant. Overcome Heim's challenge Wieland's son Whitech fierce combat Dietrich in peril peace terms. Dietrich was the son of great Dietmar, king of Bern, whose brother was the fierce king Ermenrich. He was but seven years old when there came to his father's court the battle hero, Hildebrand, far famed for valorous deeds. Unto that great warrior was given the care of the young prince, so that he might gain manly wisdom and skill in feats of arms. Fast friends they became ere long, and faithful were they one to another in after years, until death did thrust them apart. It chanced that when the lad grew strong, and had desire for daring adventure, a giant and a giantess, whose names were Grimm and Hilda, ravaged the land with fire, and did slaughter many goodly subjects. Dietmar raised a mighty army and went out against them, but he could discover not the hiding place of the monsters, who ever came forth unawares to work their evil designs. Now Dietrich had great desire to combat with the giant and giantess, for he was brave as he was strong, and he sought most of all to win a warrior's renown. With Hildebrand he hunted one fair morning in a deep forest. They came to a green and open space, when suddenly a dwarf started up and ran to escape them. The lad gave speedy chase, and soon he had the little man in his power. His name was Alberich, and he had fame as a cunning robber and a wonder smith. Dietrich desired to slay him, but the dwarf cried out. Kill me not, O Prince of Bern, and thou shalt have for thyself the great sword which I forged for Grimm and Hilda. It is called Naglaring, nor is its equal to be found in the world. I shall also guide thee unto a cavern where much treasure lies hidden. Dietrich promised to spare the life of the dwarf if his promise were fulfilled, and Alberich said, Thou must needs combat with Grimm, who hath the strength of twelve men, and also with Hilda, who is even more to be feared. Ere thou canst possess thyself of the treasure. Binding vows were then taken by Alberich, who promised to return at eventide with the wondrous sword. As the dwarf promised so did he do. He met Dietrich and Hildebrand close to a great mountain cliff, and delivered up the shining sword, Naglaring. Proud was the lad of that wondrous weapon, which brought him, as it befell, great fame in after years. The dwarf then vanished, and Hildebrand and Dietrich went towards the cliff. Ere long they found the secret door and opened it. The sunlight streamed within, and they beheld, lying beside a fire, Gaunt Grimm and Hilda, who both at once sprang up angrily in desired vengeful combat. The giant sought for his Naglaring, but found it not. Cunningly indeed had the robber dwarf taken it from him. The giant then seized a burning log and leapt at Dietrich. Fast and ferocious were his blows, and the lad would full surely have been slain but for the sword he wielded. Hilda sprang at Hildebrand and wrestled with him. Long and fierce was the struggle, because the warrior had great strength, but the giantess held him tightly round the neck, until, gasping for breath, 
Hildebrand fell to the ground. So was he completely overcome, and the end of his days seemed to be very nigh. In vain the old warrior called upon Dietrich, who waged desperate conflict with the giant. But at length the lad prevailed. Leaping aside to escape a mighty blow, he smote Grimm with Naglaring and cut off his head. So perished the ferocious giant, who had laid desolate a great part of the kingdom of Dietmar. Hildebrand was meanwhile in sore distress. Hilda began to bind him, so that he might be put to death by torture, but Dietrich smote her so great a blow that he clave her body in twain. But she relaxed not thereat her ferocious embrace of the swooning warrior. Such was her power that she united her severed parts before the lad's eyes, and caused herself to be made whole again. So Dietrich smote her the second time right through the middle, and yet again she was joined together as before. Hildebrand cried faintly, Leap thou between the hag's severed body when thou dost strike next, and turn thine eyes from her. As the warrior bade, so did Dietrich do. He cut Hilda in twain, and immediately separated her body with his own, nor did he look round. That was the end of Hilda.115 No longer could she work her evil will. So she cried. If Grimm had fought with Dietrich as well as I have fought with Hildebrand, we should ne'er have been overcome. Then life went from her, and Hildebrand was set free. The old warrior embraced the prince, praising his valor and skill, and the glory of battle gleamed in the eyes of Dietrich. Great was the treasure which was concealed in the cavern. Dietrich took for himself a wondrous shining helmet. It was named Hildegrim, after the giant and the giantess, and it gave more than a mortal strength to the hero who wore it. The prince put the helmet on his head. He triumphed in the power it gave him. Then with Hildebrand he returned unto his sire, King Dietmar, who rejoiced greatly because of the valorous deeds of his son, and he made him a full knight before all the people. There lived among the mountains to the west a great giant whose name was Sijnot, and he vowed to be avenged upon Dietrich because that he slew Grimm, his uncle, and Hilda, his aunt, and possessed himself of their treasure. And especially the helmet Hildegrim. One day Dietrich rode forth alone to hunt in the deep forest, and in the midst of it he found Sijnot lying fast asleep. Proud was the lad of his strength, and overconfident withal, and he desired greatly to combat with the giant. So he dismounted and went fearlessly towards him and kicked his body. Sijnot leapt up in anger. At last thou art come, he cried. Long have I waited for thee, Prince of Bern, so that I might take vengeance for the slaying of my kinsman Grimm. The giant seized his great spear, and Dietrich drew his sword Naglaring. But unequal was the combat. The giant smote but a single blow with the spear haft and felled the prince, whom he speedily bound. Then he bore Dietrich through the forest, and cast him into a dark, underground cavern, which was a dragon's lair. Snakes crept about and hissed in the darkness, the prince had need to combat with them. Meanwhile Hildebrand went through the forest searching for the prince. He wondered because he could not hear his huntsman's horn, and when he found his horse bound to a tree, he feared greatly that Dietrich had been slain. Great was the grief of Hildebrand. Suddenly he heard heavy footsteps coming through the trees, and ere long the great Sijnot confronted him. Who art thou, and whom dost thou seek? the giant bellowed. Hildebrand is my name, answered the bold warrior, and I seek for Dietrich, prince of Bern. The giant thrust his spear at him, but Hildebrand fought fiercely with his sword. Ere long, despite his valor, the warrior was disarmed, and Sijnot caught him by the beard, and dragged him through the forest, bellowing the while. Follow me, Longbeard, follow me, now are Grimm and Hilda avenged. Soon shalt thou find thy prince of Bern. Now never before had a foeman dared to lay hands upon Hildebrand's beard, and for that reason he was more wroth with than afraid of the giant. As the warrior was being thus ignobly dragged to the cave in which Dietrich lay bound, he saw the sword Naglaring lying on the ground. Nimbly he clutched it ere his captor was aware, and, striking fiercely, he wounded the giant, who suddenly relaxed his hold so that the warrior leapt free. Then did fearless Hildebrand smite Sijnot and slay him with a single blow. 
so perished the kinsman of Grimm when he deemed proudly that his vengeance was complete. Deep was the underground cavern in which Dietrich was kept captive. The prince heard the voice of Hildebrand calling to him, and entreated him to make haste. Many vipers still remain alive, he said, although not a few have I slain and devoured. Hildebrand cast off his clothing, and each garment did he tear in shreds. Then he made a rope which he lowered into the dark, snake-infested cavern, so that the prince might have release from his torture and unceasing conflict. Dietrich seized the rope, but when Hildebrand began to pull him up, it snapped asunder. Twas then that the dwarf Agaric came nigh, rejoicing because that Sijnot was slain. He speedily procured a rope ladder, and it was lowered to Dietrich, who was thus given escape from the dragon's cave and the hissing snakes that swarmed there. The prince embraced his rescuer, but Hildebrand did chide him much because that he had ventured forth in the forest alone. Then they took leave of the dwarf Agaric, and returned together unto Bern. When the people came to know that the giant Sijnot was slain, they rejoiced greatly, and acclaimed Hildebrand and the fearless son of Dietmar. Now there was not in all the kingdom a young warrior who was Dietrich's equal. His fame went far and wide, and bold knights came riding to Bern so that they might win his favour with challenge to feats of arms. Those who were worthy and of high birth did the prince choose to be his followers. In time he had thus command of many valorous knights. Among these were Whitage and Heim, who had great fierceness and daring, and were so gloomy and cruel of heart that in peace as in war they were dreaded and shunned. Men they smote and women they hated and scorned, many young warriors they slew in conflict. Churls were they both, and how they came to be honoured by Dietrich must now be told. Heim came first unto Bern. Dwarfish was he in stature, but his heart was full of valour, and he had strength beyond his years. He feared not the prince, despite his mighty fame. Unto him did his sire Studas, who was a breeder of war steeds amidst the mountains, give a swift grey horse, which was named Rispa, and the sword Blutgang. When he rode boldly into the courtyard of the castle at Bern, Heim challenged Dietrich to single combat. The prince was made angry thereat. Hastily did he put his armour on and the shining helmet Hildegrim. Then with his spear in one hand, and in the other his great red shield on which was pictured a golden lion, he charged the bold and lowborn stranger. Terrible was the shock. Heim's shield was pierced through, but Dietrich's horse stumbled so that he came nigh to being thrown. Both their spears were broken in twain. Then did the young warriors, leaping to the ground, cast aside their spears' hafts and draw their shining swords. Fiercely did they combat one against the other. But Blutgang rang faintly against Naglaring. Heim had skill and valor, but ere long his sword was cloven and shattered so that he was placed at Dietrich's mercy. But the prince was drawn towards him by reason of his prowess, and slew him not. He honored, in generous mood, the surly stranger, and gave him place among his knight followers. Ere many days passed another young warrior, seeking adventure, challenged the son of Dietmar to combat. His name was Whitage, and he did high from Denmark. The prince was moved with wrath against him, for he grew weary of the conflicts with each bold stranger who sought to put his skill and valour to test. But in that fierce Dane he met a knight who was more than his equal. Now Whitage was the son of Wieland, the wonder smith, a cunning and far-famed worker in iron. Skillful was the lad with bow and arrows, as was Igel, his uncle. He scorned to work at the forge, and desired to seek adventures, so that he might win renown as a warrior. Of the fame of Dietrich he heard one day, and he resolved to challenge him to single combat. Wieland could not prevail upon him to remain at home, so he fashioned for Whitage a suit of shining armor, a great helmet, dragon-mounted, a spear of much strength, and a white shield on which was painted a hammer and tongs. Unto the lad he also gave a wonder sword of great sharpness, named Mamung, which he had aforetime forged by compulsion for a tyrant king. Whitage then set out to journey towards Bern in the land of the Aemlungs. On his way he met Hildebrand and Heim, who were also riding to Dietmar's court with a stranger knight. Whitage waited them not, for they sought to rest a while. Soon he drew nigh to a strong castle in which twelve robbers had their dwelling. 
These, when they did behold the young knight coming towards them, spake one to another, saying, His shining armour shall we take from him, and his right hand shall we cut off, and then send him homeward. So they sallied forth against Whelan's strong son. Two rode in front and bade the lad surrender, but Whitage drew the sword Mamung and slew them right speedily. The others charged against him and waged fierce and unequal conflict. Twas then that Hildebrand and Heim and the strange knight came nigh. Hildebrand urged his companions to hasten to Whitage's aid, but Heim said, Help him not, his pride is great, now let his valor be put to proof. But the old warrior would suffer not that the robbers should slay the youthful hero, so he rode forward and the others followed him. Against the fierce band did they all battle together, save Heim, who looked on, and ere long seven lay dead on the ground, and the others were making swift escape. Whitage gave thanks unto Hildebrand, and together they took vows of knightly fellowship to be ever brotherly and true in aftertime. Whither goest thou, valorous youth? asked the elder warrior. I ride towards Bern, the son of Wieland made answer, for it is my desire to meet with Dietrich in single combat. Hildebrand cared not to hear speech so bold from that valiant young hero. Indeed he feared for Dietrich's safety. So when night fell, and the Dane lay fast asleep, he drew from the lad scabbard the sword Mamung and placed in it his own. At morning Teed Whitage called upon Dietrich to display his valor. As the tale has been told, Dietmar's son waxed wroth, because that the Dane was of lowly birth, being, indeed, but the son of a smith. In vain did Hildebrand warn him of the youth's prowess and skill at arms. The time is at hand, Dietrich said, when peace must prevail in the kingdom. I shall allow no churlish stranger to challenge me to conflict. Heavily shall he pay for his boldness. It may be, Hildebrand said, that thou shalt not prevail against this valorous youth. Him shall I have this day hanged outside the gates of Bern, answered the prince. Ere thou art able to accomplish that, Hildebrand said, thou hast a fierce battle to fight. I bid thee success, but not without fear. Never before did Dietrich meet a doughtier warman. Strong and rapid were the blows which Whitage gave. He smote the prince heavily on the head, but the helmet Hildegrim resisted the edge of Hildebrand's sword, and the Dane cursed his sire Wieland because that his sword was of so little avail. Had I but a sword worthy my strength, he cried, victory would speedily be mine. Dietrich pressed him hard. With both hands he grasped the sword Naglaring, and made daring onslaught with purpose to smite off the head of Wieland's son. But Hildebrand went between the warrior youths and called a truce. Spare thou his life, he cried to Dietrich, and thou shalt have still yet another brave knight amidst thy followers. The dog shall die this day, the prince made angry retort. Stand thou aside, so that his life may have end. The old knight was angry. He drew from his scabbard the sword which Wieland fashioned, and gave it unto Whitage, saying, Thine own sword Mamung I return unto thee. Now defend thyself as befits thy valour. Glad thereat was the heart of Wieland's son. Alas, he cried, that I did curse my sire. Behold, O Dietrich, the sword Mamung. Now have I as great desire for battle as a thirsty man hath for drink and a hungry dog for its food. Twas then the sword sang loud. Mimung clove armor and shield as they were but cloth. The son of Wieland indeed struck mighty blows, and in time he wounded Dietrich, indeed, five wounds did he give unto the prince, so that he was forced to call upon Hildebrand to put end to the fray. But the old warrior was wroth with Dietrich, and did heed him not. King Dietmar then called upon Wieland's son to cease fighting, and promised him great gifts and a noble bride. But Whitage waxed in battle fury, and sought for naught else but the death of that arrogant prince. Blow after blow he gave, until at length he split asunder the helmet Hildegrim, so that Dietrich's golden hair appeared. Hildebrand desired not the prince's death. His wrath was melted when he perceived he was in peril, and he leapt forward and ended the fray. Then besought he Whitage, because of the vows they had taken one with another, to swear fellowship with Dietrich and become his knight. As the old warrior desired him, so did Whitage do. 
he sheathed his sword and took oath of service to the prince, and they became fast friends. Together they went into the castle and drank wine. But ill-pleased was Dietrich because that he was not the victor as aforetime, and he made resolve to go forth to seek further daring adventure, so that his fame might not be sullied in the land of the Aemlons. Chapter 38 The Land of Giants Maidens of Jotgrim the storm giant Ek his search for Dietrich combat in dark forest giant slain the well nymph maiden in flight, ex brother fasled overcome by the prince the beast arrival at castle giants. Treachery the knights who quarreled Heim becomes a robber. Dietrich rode along through the forest in thick darkness. He journeyed towards Jotgrim mountain, where dwelt the beauteous princesses who had heard of his fame and desired greatly to behold him. The prince dreamed not of their treachery, or of the perils that he must needs pass through. Now there were three young giants who wooed the maidens. They were brothers, and their names were Ek and Fazold and Ebenrot. Ek, which signifies, the terrifier, was but eighteen years old. He had already won fame as a warrior in single combat, but having slain one foeman he could find not another who dared to contend against him. Oft had he heard of Dietrich's valor and great deeds, and he vowed that he would lay him low. Unto Ek was promise made in the land of giants that if he slew Dietrich he should have for wife Seeberg, the fairest of the three princesses in Jokgrim. Ek had wondrous strength. Twice seven days and twice seven nights he could fast and travel onwards, nor ever feel faint, from hill to hill he could leap like a leopard. He required no steed, nor was there one that could carry him. When the strong giant came to know that Dietrich was to ride forth from Bern, he prepared to go against him. The princess Seaberg clad her lover in bright armor and wished him well. He made swift departure. When he entered the forest the birds fled terrified before him, branches were bowed down and rudely shaken as he passed, trees swayed and groaned, and those that he smote crashed down and were uprooted. So rushed Ek upon his way until he reached Bern, where he was told that Dietrich had gone towards Jokgrim by another way. Without pause the giant followed after the valorous prince. So swift was his pace that he came nigh to him ere night fell. He beheld four knights lying on the ground. But one alone was alive, and he was grievously wounded. Seek not the knight of Bern, the wounded man said, like to lightning is his sword stroke. Ek went onward, raging furiously he went. He feared not Dietrich, his heart's desire was to combat against the arrogant hero. Night fell as he went through the trees. In the blackness he heard a horseman coming nigh. Who art thou, he cried, that rideth through the darkened forest. A deep strong voice made answer, Dietrich of Bern. Thou shalt fight with me, Ek cried, for he was impatient to win renown. But Dietrich desired not to combat with any foeman in the darkness, and rode on. Ek strode beside the knight of Bern, and made boast of his armor. By Wieland, the wonder smith, was it fashioned, Ek said, nor can thy blade nagloring cleave it. Bright and sharp is mine own sword Ek Sax. Twas forged by him who made nagloring, of gold is the hilt, and it is inlaid with gold. Of fine gold is my girdle also. Much booty will be thine if thou canst overcome me. But Dietrich could not be tempted to fight for sword nor treasure in the forest blackness. Ek was made angry. Thee shall I proclaim as a coward, he cried, because thou art afraid. When day breaks, Dietrich said, I shall combat with thee. Here in the darkness we can behold and not one another. But Ek, confronting him, refused to wait. Thou shalt have the princess Seaberg for thy bride if thou art ready now for combat. Fairest is she of all maidens upon earth. Dietrich leapt from his horse. By the gods, he cried, I shall fight thee now, not for thy treasure nor even thy sword, but for Seaberg the fair one. On stones did they strike their swords. The fire sparks flashed bright, and they beheld one another in the blaze and began to fight. Nor was there darkness then, for their swords glowed like flames as they smote together and flashed in the blackness. The clamor of battle roared like thunder through the forest, the heavens heard the clash of their shields. The night was filled with terror, the trees were scorched about them, the grass was trodden under the ground by their feet. 
long they fought, nor did one wound the other. Then Ek bounded against the prince with all his strength, their shields were interlocked, and Dietrich stumbled and fell. Ek held him down and said, If thou wilt permit me to bind thee, thy life shall I spare. Fain would I deliver thee thus unto Seaburg with thine armor and thy steed. Death is better than shame, Dietrich made answer. So they wrestled one with another in the darkness. In vain did Eck strive to overcome the knight of Bern, who at length clutched the giant's great throat, and sought to roll over him. Long and terrible was that fierce struggle. Nor would one make peace with the other although they were of equal strength. In vain did the prince beseech Eck to swear oaths of fellowship with him. Dietrich's steed at length broke free. It heard his cries and ran towards him in the night. Falk was its name, and it loved the prince better than life. Now it came to his aid, and, rearing high, the bold steed leapt upon the body of Eck and broke his back. Dietrich leapt to his feet, and seizing the giant's great sword he struck fire, and in the sudden blaze he smote off his foeman's head. Then was there silence in the forest. When dawn broke through the trees Dietrich clad himself in the giant's shining armor, he girded on the mighty sword Eck's axe, then rode on his way with the head of Eck dangling from his saddle bow. He had no great joy in his victory, because he feared that he would be accused of killing Eck in his sleep. Point one sixteen. Dietrich rode on until he came to a forest spring and beheld a water nymph lying beside it wrapped in soft slumber. He laid hands on her, and she awoke. Then did the nymph heal the prince's wounds, and he became strong again. She pointed out to him the path which led unto Jokrim mountain, and gave warning of the dangers which would beset him. Then did Dietrich mount his steed again and ride towards the land of the giants. As he went through the forest a beauteous maid came running towards him. Swift were her steps, and her face was pale and terror-stricken, because that she was pursued by the giant Fazold, ex-brother, and his fierce hounds. Point one seventeen. Dietrich gave the maiden his protection, and went against the giant who pursued her. When Fazold beheld the prince clad in Eck's armor, he cried. Art thou my brother Eck riding hither on a steed? Dietrich made answer, I am not thy brother, him have I slain. Thou dog of death, bellowed Fazold, thou hast murdered Eck whilst he lay in sleep, else would he never have been overcome. I fling thee back thy falsehood, Dietrich answered. Thy brother challenged me to fight in darkness for the sake of fair Seaburg. Had I known he was of such great strength I should ne'er have crossed swords with him. Roth was Fazold, and he rushed against Dietrich. Stronger was he than Eck. In combat he scorned to strike more than one blow, never before was a second required. Fiercely he smote his brother's slayer, and Dietrich fell from his horse and lay in a swoon. The giant then turned away and went towards the castle. He deemed that the prince was slain. Dietrich lay not long upon the ground. His strength returned to him, he rose up, he leapt upon his horse, he hastened after the giant, for he desired to be avenged. Now Fazold had vowed never to combat with any foeman who survived his first blow, but Dietrich taunted him, saying, Thou art afraid to stand against me. A coward is Fazold, else would he combat with his brother's slayer. The giant turned fiercely, for no longer could he endure the prince's words. Swiftly were their swords drawn, and hot but not brief was the conflict. Thrice was Dietrich wounded, but five times had he wounded with Exax the giant Fazold, who at length cried out for mercy. If thou wilt but spare my life, Fazold said, thee shall I serve, and ever be thy faithful henchman. Had I not slain thy brother, answered Dietrich, I would have thee gladly for my knight, but I can claim not the service of one whose kin I have wronged. Yet shall I take oaths of fellowship with thee. Let us pledge ourselves now to help one another in time of need, and be like unto brothers before all men. So they swore oaths of knightly brotherhood, and went together towards Jokrim Mountain. A great beast came out against them, and men say that it was like unto an elephant. Fazold would fain have let it pass, but Dietrich dismounted and made fierce attack with Exax. Yet, although he gave the monster many wounds, he could not slay it. The beast came nigh to treading him underfoot, 
but once again did. His steed Falk come to his rescue, it broke free. It leapt against and kicked the monster, which turned from the prince a while. Then Dietrich crouched under its stomach and stabbed there with the keen sword Eck, making nimble escape as the beast fell to die. 118. Then Dietrich and Fazold went on their way. They next beheld a great dragon flying towards them. It was flying very low, and in its jaws it carried a knight, who called loudly for help. Dietrich struck at the monster, but even Exax could not pierce it. Whereat the knight said, By my sword alone can the dragon be slain, but it lies within the monster's mouth. The Prince of Bern thrust his hand between the dragon's jaws. He pulled forth the sword. Wound me not when thou dost strike, the knight cried. Dietrich smote the monster with the keen-edged sword and slew it, and the captive knight was drawn forth. Thy name and lineage, the prince demanded of him. My name is Sintram, answered the knight, and kinsman am I to Hildebrand at Bern. I was journeying towards Bern, so that I might become a follower of Prince Dietrich. The dragon came upon me while I slept, else would it not have carried me away. Dietrich's heart was made glad, and he restored unto Sintram his wondrous sword, saying, I am he whom you seek to serve, even Dietrich, Prince of Bern. So they went together on their way with Fazold. Then, as they drew nigh unto Jokgrim Mountain, the giant forgot his vows, and sought to take flight. But Dietrich would not have him go free until he reached the castle in which the princesses had their dwelling. Ere long they reached a great castle. Two giant statues stood on each side of the door, and Fazold led him in. But when the prince came between the statues their arms fell, and had he not made swift escape he would have been slain by their stone clubs. Dietrich was made wroth. He turned upon Fazold forthwith, and slew him because of his treachery. Then he entered the hall, and the three princesses and their mother, the queen, came towards him, for they deemed he was Ek. Twas your desire, the prince said, to behold Dietrich of Bern. He now greets thee thus. So saying, he flung at their feet the head of the giant Ek, and then turned from them. He hastened without, and, mounting his steed, rode with Sintram towards Bern. Heim came forth to meet Dietrich and greeted him with such warmth that Dietrich gave unto him the sword Naglaring, which Alberich 119 had forged for the giant Grimm. Exax he did keep for himself. Whitage was ill-pleased because that his fellow knight was thus honoured. I forget not, he said unto Heim, that when I was beset by robbers thy sword remained in its sheath. Evil is thy tongue, thou self-sufficient man. Fain would I have it silenced, Heim said. Both knights drew their swords to combat one against the other. Dietrich was wroth and stepped between them. Then he spake to Heim saying. Rash knight, thou shalt now go hence. Twas unseemly that thou didst not aid thy fellow when robbers came against him. When by thy deeds thou hast proved thyself a hero, thou mayest return again unto Bern. With the sword thou hast given me, Heim said, I shall win more than any man can take away. He went forth alone. He waged war against the robbers and slew them, and became chief of a robber band. Many a wayfarer fell by his sword, and he was dreaded by valiant knights. He re, turned not unto Dietrich again until he was possessed of much treasure by his evil doings. Against many giants did the prince combat, but never was he in greater peril than when Lorin, the dwarf, had power over him and his knights and held them all in captivity. Chapter 39 The Wonderful Rose Garden Diet Lieb the Dane how he became a knight Cunhild stolen by the dwarf king knights to the rescue the garden laid waste Lorin's vengeance whitage overcome combat with Prince the invisible combatant Lorin is. Spared visit to mountain dwelling the banquet knights made prisoners Dietrich's fiery breath battle with dwarfs and giants the end of strife. First be it told of the lady Cunhild's brother, Diet Lieb the Dane. He had fame in his own land for strength and prowess, and great and glorious were the deeds of his sire, the brave Jarl Beikrolf. It chanced that when the three journeyed towards Bern they were set upon by Heim and his robber band in the midst of a forest. Boldly fought the Danes, and the robbers were all killed, save Heim alone, whom Dietlieb, with his sword well sung, 
wounded on the forehead and put to flight. Thereafter the young Dane became a servant unto Dietrich, making pretense that his name was Omenrich. It chanced that the prince paid visit to the court of Ermenrich, and there was his Danish servant taunted by Walter of Wastgenstein. Dietlieb was wroth, and he challenged the arrogant knight, wagering life against life, to prevail against him in performing feats of strength. All the court assembled to behold the sport, and the knight was boastful and proud. But great was the might of Dietlieb the Dane. He could put the stone and throw the hammer so that men marveled to behold, nor could Walter of Wastgenstein prevail against him. Then did King Ermenrich pay life ransom in money for the boastful knight, and the Dane gave a great feast to which his master did invite many valorous war men. Proud was Dietrich of his servant, and he made him a knight. Heim, who had returned, was present at the feast, and Dietlieb sat beside him, and ere long he spake, saying, On thy forehead is an evil scar, Heim. How came thou by it? Heim made answer, I shall tell thee in secret, Ilmenric. Wounded was I in combat with Dietlieb the Dane. I shall rest not until my shame be wiped out with his life blood. Know then, the new knight whispered, that I am he whom thou didst attack with thy robber band. Look in my face. I am no other than Dietlieb. Fast was thy horse, else thou hadst not escaped me. But I seek not now to denounce thee before Dietrich. Let this secret be kept between us. It chanced upon a day thereafter that fair Cunhild, Dietlieb's sister, danced with her maids upon a green meadow. She went towards a linden tree, then suddenly she vanished from sight. The king of dwarfs, whose name was Lauren, had long loved her for her beauty, and desired to have her for his bride. So he came secretly towards the maiden, and below the linden tree he cast over her his cloak of obscurity. Then did he carry fair Cunhild away towards his castle among the Tyrolese mountains. The heart of Dietlieb was filled with sorrow, because that he loved his sister very dearly. He hastened unto Hildebrand, who dwelt in his castle at Garda, and besought his aid, saying, The castle of Lauren is in the midst of a Tyrol mountain, and in front of it he hath a wondrous rose garden. Many a life may be lost ere Cunhild is rescued. Hildebrand said, But let us unto Dietrich and his knights, so that we may take counsel with them. When that the knights came to know that Cunhild was taken away by the dwarf king, Wolfhart spake boldly, as was his wont, and said, Alone shall I ride forth and rescue this fair maid. Dietrich heard the boast, nor made answer. He spake to wise old Hildebrand, saying, Knowest thou aught of Lauren's rose garden? Tis told, Hildebrand said, that it hath four gates of gold. But no wall shields it. Round the rose garden is drawn a silken thread, and he who breaks it shall have his right hand and left foot cut off. Lauren, king of dwarfs, ever keeps watch o'er his wondrous garden, which is of exceeding great beauty. Whitage spake, Lauren can punish not an offender who entereth his garden until he doth prevail against him in single combat. Then shall we fare forth, Dietrich said. We seek but Cunhild, and need not despoil the rose garden. So the prince rode towards the Tyrol mountain in which Lauren, king of dwarfs, had his dwelling. With him went Hildebrand, Herebrand's son, Whitage, Wieland's son, Dietlieb the Dane, and Wolfhart, Hildebrand's kinsman. Dietrich and Whitage rode in front, because that Hildebrand had taunted the prince, as was his wont, for he had been his master. Were I not with thee, he said, thou couldst not overcome the dwarf. So it fell that Dietrich and Wieland's son were first to reach the wondrous rose garden. Whitage broke to pieces a golden gate, and they entered together. Fair were the roses, and of sweet and refreshing fragrance. Their beauty gladdened Dietrich's eyes, and he was loath to despoil them. But Whitage sought to defy the dwarf, and he rode through the blossoming shrubs, trampling them ruthlessly underfoot. Soon was the fair garden made desolate as a wilderness. Roth was Lorin, king of the dwarfs. He rode forth on his steed, clad in full armor, his spear was in his hand. But three spans high was he, yet had he wondrous strength and skill in conflict. What evil have I done thee that thou shouldst thus destroy my roses, he cried bitterly. 
Thy right hand and thy left foot I now demand, and must needs obtain. Whitage defied the dwarf with laughter and scorn. He deemed not that he was endowed with magical power. Diamond sparkled upon Lauren's armor, these made it sword-proof and spear-proof. He also wore a girdle which gave him the strength of twelve men. On his head was a shining crown, and therein was his weakness. Golden birds sang forth from it as if they were alive. Whitage lowered his spear. Lauren charged fiercely, and at the first thrust swept him from the saddle. In great peril was Whelan's son, for the dwarf bound him, but Dietrich made offer of gold to atone the evil he had done. Thy roses, he told Lauren, will bloom again in May. The dwarf made answer that he possessed already gold in abundance, but that his roses could not be restored unto him. Whitage taunted Dietrich. Fearest thou to tilt with him, he said, must I die because thou dost shrink from Lauren? The prince was wroth, and he challenged the dwarf king forthwith to single combat, taking upon himself the blame for the evil which his knight had accomplished. Twas well for Dietrich that old Hildebrand then rode up with Wolfhart, his kinsman, and Dietlib the Dane. The old warrior counseled the prince to tilt not with the dwarf. Rather shouldst thou fight him on foot with sword against sword, he said. His armor thou canst not pierce, for by reason of the diamonds it is charmed against all weapons. Smite thou him upon the head. As Hildebrand counseled, so did Dietrich do. He leapt from the saddle and challenged Lauren to combat with swords. Fierce was the conflict. The prince smote upon the dwarf's head blow after blow, so that he was made faint. But Lauren drew round him his cloak of obscurity and fought then unbeholden by the prince of Bern. Many wounds did Dietrich receive, but he waxed in battle fury and suddenly took the unseen dwarf in his arms and wrestled with him. From the prince's mouth issued forth flames of fire, but without avail, he could not injure Lauren. Snatch off his waist girdle, Hildebrand cried. Ere long Dietrich possessed himself of the magic girdle, which gave to the dwarf his great strength. Then the prince had him in his power. He cast the little king on the ground and tore off the cloak of obscurity. Lauren feared that he would be put to death, so he called upon Dietlib, Cunhild's brother, who pleaded for his life, for the young Dane desired most of all to discover where his fair sister was held in captivity. Thus did the dwarf king escape the vengeance of Dietrich. He gave thanks unto Dietlib, and when he had sworn oaths of brotherhood with him, he invited the prince and all his knights into his mountain castle. They went together over a pleasant plain, and through a fair forest. A great linden tree was there, and many fruit trees whose odors were sweet. Birds sang merrily in the branches, and Dietrich was glad of heart. He began to make answer to the birds, but old Hildebrand warned him not to whistle until he had left the wood. All the knights were light-hearted save Whitage. He had bitter memory of how the dwarf had prevailed against him, and suspected treachery. Wolfhart taunted him, but Whelan's son rode in front. He was first to reach the castle entrance. He saw there a bright golden horn suspended on a chain. He blew a loud blast upon it. When he did that the door opened wide and they all went within. An iron door was opened, it closed behind them. Then through a door of shining gold they went, it was shut fast like to the other. Soon Dietrich and his knights found themselves in a bright and spacious hall. Hundreds of dwarfs were there. They made merry, they danced and they held tournaments. Delicious wine was given unto the strangers, and even Whitage forgot to be suspicious, and made merry with the others. Then did Lauren begin to work his evil designs. He cast a spell upon Dietrich and his knights, so that they could behold not one another. They saw but the merry dwarfs and the glories of the mountain dwelling. At length fair Cunhild appeared. She had been made Lauren's queen, and wore a gleaming crown. Many maidens came with her, but she was fairest of them all. Dwarfs playing harps, and dancing and performing strange feats, skipped before her and around. In her crown shone a bright jewel. It dispelled the magic mist, and the warriors beheld one another again. Then was a great feast held. Cunhild sat with Lauren and Dietlib, whom she embraced tenderly, 
she took beside her. They spoke in low voices one to another. Great was her desire to leave all the splendor and wealth that was there, and return once again to her own kin. The dwarf persuaded all the knights to lay down their arms. So merry were they that they did so without fear. Evening came on, and Lauren led Dietleib to a chamber apart, where he made offer to him of rich treasure if he would desert Dietrich and his knights. But the young Dane refused resolutely to be a traitor, whereat the dwarf vanished and the door was locked securely. Dietleib was made blind. Then were the strangers given wine, which caused them all to fall into a deep sleep. The vengeful King Lorin thus had them in his power. He caused them to be bound, and they were all cast together into a deep dungeon, so that vengeance might be wreaked upon them, because that the rose garden had been despoiled. There they lay helpless and blind. Cunhild wept for them. When the dwarfs were all asleep she stole in secret to her brother's chamber and gave to him a golden ring which dispelled his magic blindness. Then did the young Dane secure possession of his weapons and those of his fellow knights. Meanwhile Dietrich woke up. Wroth was he when he found that he was fettered. The dwarf's girdle restored his sight, and flames issued from his mouth, which melted his bonds of iron, so that he rose up. He went towards each of his companions and set them free one by one. Dietlib then came with all their weapons, and with the prince he fought fiercely against the dwarfs. At length Dietrich wrenched from one of them a golden ring. He gave it unto Hildebrand, and his sight was restored. Then did the old warrior enter the conflict. The dwarfs fell fast before them. Thousands were put to death, for there was none in Lorin's castle who could prevail against the three great warriors. At length Lorin rushed without. He blew a great blast upon his horn, and five giants armed with clubs came to his aid. Wolfhart and Whitage were still blind, but they could rest not while the clamor of battle raged about them, so they rushed into the fray and fought bravely. Then gave Cunhild unto them jeweled rings, and their blindness was dispelled. The five giants fought against the five knights, and long and terrible was the struggle which ensued. But one by one the monsters were slain, and Dietrich and his knights were triumphant. The heroes waded knee deep in blood, so great was the slaughter which they accomplished in the kingdom of Lorin. Then was the dwarf king made prisoner and Cunhild set free. Dietrich and his knights possessed themselves of much treasure, and they returned unto Bern, taking with them Lorin and Dietleib's fair sister. Lorin was laughed at and put to shame, and he brooded over his evil lot, desiring greatly to be avenged upon Dietrich and his victorious knights. So he sent a secret message unto his uncle, Walbrin, who was king over the giants and dwarfs in the eastern Caucasus, and besought him to come to his rescue. He spoke secretly thereanent unto Cunhild, whereat she made promise that if he swore oaths of friendship with Dietrich, she would return with him to his mountain dwelling and be his queen once again. So she prevailed upon Lorin to do her will. My rose garden, he said, I shall plant again that the roses may bloom fair and fragrant in the sunshine of May. The dwarf king drank wine with the prince of Bern and made peace, vowing to be his lifelong comrade and helper. As they sat together at the feast, a message was borne unto Dietrich from King Walbrun, demanding all the treasure and all the weapons that were in Bern. And the right hand and left foot of every knight who had wrought destruction in the rose garden. Defiantly did the prince make answer and prepared for battle. Dietrich and Walbrun challenged each other to single combat, and they fought with great fierceness. Numerous were their wounds, nor could one prevail over the other. It seemed as if they would both be slain. Then did Lorin ride forth, and, embracing his uncle, he prevailed upon him to make peace. Hildebrand pleaded likewise with Dietrich, and the combat was brought to an end. Together they then sat down to feast and drink wine, and they vowed oaths of friendship, so that there might be lasting peace between them. Cunhild returned with Lorin unto his mountain dwelling. The rose garden was planted once again, and it bloomed fair in the sunshine of May. Herdsmen among the hills, and huntsmen who wend thither, have been wont to tell that they could behold on moonlight nights Lorin and fair Cunhild dancing together in the green forests and in the valleys below the Tyrolese mountains. Dietlib's sister hath still her dwelling in the bright castle as in other days. 
she is queen of the dwarfs and can never die. The rose garden blooms ever fair, but unbeholden by men, in the sunshine of May, and many have sought to find it in vain. Chapter 40 Virginal Queen of the Mountains The maid devouring giant Hildebrand slays Orcus Dietrich and the giant's knight battle the black horseman slaughter of monsters castle muter prince taken prisoner the rescue Genebas surrounds Virginal's castle magic tablet the avalanches a peerless Queen Dietrich wins his bride. Tidings came unto Dietrich at Bern that Virginal, Queen of the Mountains, was in sore distress because that a giant wasted her land and had perforce to obtain as tribute, at each new moon, a fair maiden, whom he did devour. The prince set forth with old Hildebrand to give aid to the queen, who had great beauty, and ruled over those dwarfs and giants in the Tyrolese mountains that never sought to do injury unto mankind. Her oppressor was named Orcus, whose son was Genebas, an evil magician. As the two heroes rode through the forest there came unto them a dwarf whose name was Bibung. He guided them towards Jerespunt, where the queen had her dwelling, but when night came he vanished. Snow fell next morning, and the knights were parted one from another. Ere long Hildebrand heard bitter cries, and he beheld a fair maiden who had been taken to the forest so that the giant might obtain her for tribute. Fairest was she of Queen Virginal's maidens. The knight proffered his protection and vowed to rescue her, whereat her heart was filled with gratitude and her eyes with joy tears. Soon the forest was shaken with dread clamor, for the giant was coming nigh with his dogs to possess himself of his prey. Hildebrand drew his sword. Not slow was he to enter the conflict, and ere long he slew the giant and put to flight his evil son Genebas. The maiden returned with glad heart unto the queen, and gave tidings of how the giant Orcus had been slain. There was great rejoicing in the castle, and eagerly did Virginal and all her people await the coming of the heroes. Meanwhile Dietrich fought with many of the giant's followers. The clamor of battle resounded far and near, and when Hildebrand hastened to his aid the horde was overcome, many were slain and many made escape. Together did they then go upon their way towards the palace of Jerespunt. Darkness came on, and they rode to the gate of the castle of Orcus, deeming it theirs by right of conquest. But small hospitality were they shown. No sooner did they demand entrance than fierce giants issued forth against them. Heavy clubs they bore, and they smote fiercely, but soon they were overcome by the valorous heroes. Then appeared a black horseman. He spake in a strange tongue, and giants sprang up out of the earth to continue the fight. As they were cut down others took their place, and when all the giants were slain, hissing snakes and nameless reptiles issued forth against Dietrich and Hildebrand, so that they had to fight constantly throughout the night. The black horseman entered not the fray, and when dawn broke he vanished from sight. Then did the heroes enter the castle and set at liberty three of Queen Virginal's maidens whom they found there. Now, during the night the heroes slew a fierce dragon. It carried in its jaws a brave knight whose name was Rentwin, and with him did Dietrich and Hildebrand journey towards his father's castle. There did they remain until their wounds were healed. Thereafter the prince and his veteran companion set forth with Rentwin and his sire towards Jerespunt. Eager was Dietrich to behold the fair maiden Queen Virginal. He spurred his steed. He rode in front, and ere long he was lost to his fellow knights. Twas ill for him that he waited not for them, because the way was strange and wild, and he wandered from the straight path. So it chanced that he came unto the castle of Duke Nitger, called Muter. Now the duke had many giants, and when one of them issued forth, Dietrich asked of him to be guided unto the palace of Queen Virginal. Answer was given him according to his desire, but when he turned to ride away the giant smote the hero with his club so that he fell from his horse. Then was brave Dietrich seized and bound and thrown into a dark dungeon. The duke's sister treated him with kindness. But for her protection the prince would have been put to death. When Hildebrand reached the palace of Virginal he received tidings that the prince had been taken captive. So he hastened back unto Bern, and rode forth with many brave knights, among whom were Wolfhart and Whitech and Heim. They laid siege to Castle Muter and fought against twelve giants. While the battle waged fiercely, Dietrich made escape and entered the fray. 
Victory was then with the heroes of Bern, and all the giants were slain. The knight sought to put Duke Nicker to death, but his sister pleaded for him, and his life was spared by Dietrich. Then did they all set forth towards Gerespunt, on their way they beheld a dwarf riding towards them. Unto Dietrich spake the little man, and he told that fierce Genebas had surrounded the palace of Queen Virginal with a great army, and made demand of all her maidens and the magic jewel in her crown which gave her power to rule over all her subjects. So the heroes pressed onward. They climbed the mountains over ice and snow, and soon they heard the fierce clamor of battle. The howling of the great black dogs of Genebas was like the howling of wintry tempests. Strange monsters fought there, and the queen's defenders were in sore straits. The voices of the giants were loud as thunder peals. In the midst of the battle Dietrich saw the black horseman. He knew him to be Genebas. An iron tablet he held in his hand and wrought spells upon it. The prince sprang upon him. His sword flashed fire. He broke in pieces the iron tablet and slew the dread worker of evil. Then pealed the loud thunder amidst the Tyrolese mountains. The glaciers were sundered, and avalanches fell upon the evil army of Genebas, which suddenly vanished from sight. Soon was there silence and peace, and an end to that dread conflict. Queen Virginal sat alone, high-throned in her mountain palace, unmoved and beautiful, brightly gleamed the jewel in her crown. A glistening silver veil was drawn round her body, and her maidens crouched trembling at her feet. When the battle was ended, Dietrich made approach, and she called him, Hero, and greeted him with love. No longer can I reign here in Elfland, she spake. Thy great deeds have I beheld, and for thy sake I shall leave my home and my kingdom, and henceforth live among men, for I shall be thy bride, and love thee so long as life may last. Then were Dietrich and Queen Virginal wedded there with pomp and ceremony, and elves and heroes feasted within the mountain palace, and drank wine and made merry. Ere long Dietrich and his bride and the brave knights journeyed together to Bern, where they were received with acclamations by the people. Dietrich and Queen Virginal lived happily together, and when King Dietmar died, the prince reigned in his place. Then was there peace within the kingdom. But evil was being wrought in another land, and it was fated that King Dietrich must become a fugitive among men ere he could triumph completely over his evil foemen. Chapter 41 Dietrich in Exile Ermenrich and Sebeshvate of the king's sons the Harlung's quarrel with Dietrich battle between kinsmen convoy captured knights ransom Dietrich surrenders his kingdom at the court of Etzel campaign against. Ermenrich boy warriors slain Whitage and the mermaid sorrow in Hunaland the Nibelung tragedy vengeance of Hagen's son end of exile. King Ermenrich was a mighty monarch, and all the rulers of the Southland owned him as overlord, and paid yearly tribute. His nephew, Dietrich, helped in his wars, and gave to him at length his fierce knights Whitage and Heim. Now it chanced that Ermenrich had an evil counselor. His name was Sebesh, 120 and his wife had been wronged by the king. Sebesh first thought to slay Ermenrich, but chose rather to cause the great monarch to murder his own children and wage war against his own kin. Terrible was the vengeance of Sebesh. By reason of it many brave knights went to their death, and for long years bitter warfare was waged. Ermenrich had three sons. Sebesh bore false witness against one and the king's second bride, Svanhild. The prince was hanged and Gudrun's daughter was trodden to death by many steeds. Another was sent to Britain as an envoy in a leaky ship and was drowned. The third, by Sebesh's advice, journeyed to Norway to demand tribute, and there was he slain. Evil charges were then made, reviling the king's nephews, the Harlungs, war was waged against them, and they were overcome and slaughtered in their Rhineland stronghold. Nor was Dietrich spared. Sebesh poisoned the mind of Ermenrich against the valiant king of the Aemlungs. Thy nephew's kingdom grows greater year by year, said Sebesh to the jealous king, ere long he shall wrest thine own from thee. Thou shouldst demand of him payment of yearly tribute. Then was the knight Randolt sent unto Bern to demand tribute, but Dietrich gave scornful refusal, whereat Ermenrich was made wroth, so that he vowed he would have his nephew hanged as a traitor. In vain did Whitage and Heim plead with the king. 
he gave ear to Sebesh, and marched against Bern with a great army. Dietrich went forth and met his sire's brother in battle array, and in a fierce night attack achieved an overwhelming victory, so that Ermenrich was beaten back. It chanced, however, that Dietrich lacked sufficient treasure to continue the war, and old Hildebrand made offer of all the gold he possessed, as did also Bertram of Pola. So the knight set forth with Wolfhart, Dietlieb the Dane, and other heroes to guard a convoy of five hundred horses bearing treasure unto Bern. Ermenrich came to know of their mission, so he had the convoy taken in ambush. Thus were the bravest knights of Dietrich made prisoners and his war treasure captured. Dietlieb alone escaped. He carried the mournful tidings of disaster unto his king. Dietrich sent envoys unto Ermenrich and offered exchange of prisoners, so that his knights might be set free, but the fierce monarch made answer that he would have them all hanged unless Dietrich ransomed them with his kingdom. Noble-hearted was Dietmar's great son. He could suffer not to reign as king if his faithful followers were put to death. His soul was sad, because that queen virginal had sickened and died, and he sent a message to Ermenrich saying that he would depart from the kingdom if the lives of Hildebrand and Wolfhart and his other knights were spared. Then Ermenrich came unto Bern with his army, and Dietrich bade farewell to his own land amidst the lamentation of the people, who loved him well. His brother, Diether, who was but a child, went with him. Old Hildebrand left behind his wife Ute and his babe Hagebrand, and followed his king, as did also the other knights for whose sake he had given up his kingdom. Dietrich took refuge in the court of Etzel 121, king of the Huns. He was made welcome there and greatly honored. He fought with Etzel against the king of Wilkina, land 122, and against the king of Russia and Poland, and achieved great conquests. Grateful was Etzel for the help which Dietrich and his knights gave him. But ever did Dietrich mourn for his lost kingdom. Queen Helche pitied him, because that he was sorrowing continually, and gave him for wife her niece, the gentle princess Herat. Soon afterwards King Etzel made promise that he would raise for Dietrich in early spring a great army, so that he might wage war against Ermenrich, and win back the kingdom of the Aemlungs. Years had passed since Dietmar's son rode forth from Bern. His brother Diether had grown into early manhood, a brave and bold young knight he was. Well loved was he by Etzel's sons, Erp and Ortwin, and when the great army assembled, the three young friends must needs go forth to battle together, for they desired greatly to win renown as valiant warmen. Etzel's queen would fain have held them back. She had dreamed in an evil dream that a dragon had entered the castle, carried away the lads, and devoured them while she looked on. But they pleaded with the king, and he gave them their desire. Dietrich vowed that they would have sure protection from danger, and Etzel sent forth with them the Margrave Rudiger and his fearless knights. With Dietrich went Diether, and old Hildebrand, Wolfhart and Dietlieb the Dane, and the other heroes who shared with their king exile in the land of Huns. Sebesh commanded the army of Ermenrich, who was stricken with sickness, and he waited for the invading army on the southern bank of the river, at Ravenna, nigh to the frontier of the kingdom of the Aemlungs. Dietrich pushed towards Bern, but when he reached the city of Istria he left his brother Diether and Etzel's sons, Erp and Ortwin, in the care of old Elson, so that they might suffer no harm. He deemed them too young to risk the perils of war against battle-hardened heroes. Ill-pleased were the lads with their lot. They made resolve to follow the army, and having deceived old Elson they stole forth from the city and rode swiftly to the front. They rode to their doom. On the night before the battle Dietrich's forces were drawn up on the north bank of the river, and old Hildebrand went out to scout. A knight came from the foeman's camp with similar intent. They met but fought not, for the night was re -annulled. They sorrowed together that friends were divided by war, and ere they parted they embraced and kissed one another. In the morning Dietrich led his knights across the river at a ford which Hildebrand had found. They fell upon Sebesh's division of the army and put it to flight. Whitage was with Sebesh, but he fled not. He rode on, he slew Dietrich's standard-bearer, but the tide of battle went past him, and soon he found himself alone. Twas then that Diether and Etzel's two sons reached the front. They saw Whitage and called him a traitor. 
Ortwin went against him, but ere long he was cut down. Then did ERP seek vengeance, he rushed against the ferocious knight. In vain did Whitage warn him to hold back lest he would share his brother's fate, but ERP, was without fear a great warrior would he have been had he lived. Brief was the conflict, for Whitage drew his sword Mamung and smote the prince so that his head was taken off. Daether sorrowed and was made wroth. He drew his sword and rode against Whitage. Whelan's son watched him drawing nigh, and he spake to the lad, saying. Say if thou art Daether, brother of Dietrich, if thou art, I desire Pot to combat with thee. Daether said, The brother of Dietrich I am indeed, as thou shalt know to thy loss ere long. Then combat against another, Whitage said, Seek battle glory elsewhere. I desire not to be thy slayer. Thou hast slain both ERP and Ortwin, cried Diether, but me thou shalt not escape. Thou dog and traitor, I would die rather than not slay thee. Bold attack made he forthwith, but Whitage feared him not. He but parried his blows. But at length Diether smote off his horse's head, and he had perforce to leap to the ground. I call to witness the god Ermin, Whitage cried, that I fight now but to defend myself. When he said that he smote at Diether with his sword Mamung and cut the young hero in twain. Whitage wept. Sad at heart was he because that he had slain the lad, and greatly, too, did he fear the wrath of Dietrich. Elson, who had followed the lads from Istria, had meanwhile found Dietrich, and he gave him tidings of their fate. Dietrich smote off his head, and hastened towards the place of sorrow. He found the dead bodies of the young heroes. He wept over them. Alas, he cried, what grief is mine! What sin have I committed that I should be punished thus? My body bears not a battle scar. I have triumphed in the field, and yet is my brother taken from me, and the sons of Etzel laid in death. Never again can I return unto the land of the Huns. He looked around him. He beheld Whitage taking flight on Diether's horse across the heath, and his heart burned to be avenged. Oil his steed Falk he leapt at a bound and rode after the traitor knight. Flames issued from his mouth, so great was his fury. As he drew nigh to Whitage, he called, Flee not before me, thou hellhound. If thou art not as great a coward as thou art a traitor, stand now that I may avenge my brother's death. Whitage paused not. He cried in answer, I had to fight for my life against Diether. Twas not my desire to combat against him. Swiftly rode Whitage until he came to the shore of the lake at the river mouth. Dietrich pressed on close behind him. His spear was in his hand, he hurled it against the traitor. But Whitage paused not, he rode into the water, and his wrathful pursuer was but a horse length behind him. Then suddenly there rose out of the lake the mermaid Waghild, his grandsire's mother. She seized Whitage and his steed and drew them beneath the waves. Dietrich rode out until his horse had to swim, but he sought in vain for his brother's slayer. Never again was Whitage beheld by human eyes, for the mermaid bore him unto her cave under the waters and guarded him there. Dietrich returned to the battlefield, and the remnants of Sebesh's army were put to flight. But Dietmar's great son had no joy in the victory, nor could he press on farther with the army of Huns, because that Etzel's two sons were slain. He could hope not for aught save the vengeance of him who had given him help to win back his kingdom. He mourned for Diether and for ERP and Ortwin, and when they were given burial he bade Rudiger to lead back the army unto the land of the Huns. So did the Margrave do, he returned unto Etzel with his heroes, he stood before the king, he gave unto him the mournful tidings of the loss of the two princes. The queen lamented aloud, but the king, whose heart was sorrow-stricken also, spake saying. So hath it happened as it ever doth in the fortunes of war. Each man must die at his appointed time. Then asked he of Rudiger, Where is Dietrich and Hildebrand? Why come they not into my presence? They mourn apart, answered the margrave, loath are they to approach thee because that ERP and Ortwin have been cut off. Then sent Etzel two knights unto Dietrich, but he refused to go with them before the king, whereat the queen, who at first was wroth against him, rose up and did herself go unto the hero. 
She spake to him, saying, How fought my sons ERP in Ortwin? Were they fearless and bold in battle and worthy their kin? Because they feared not, Dietrich answered, they fought and fell one after another. Nor would they be parted, so great was their love. The queen kissed him while she wept, and then led him before King Etzel. Then did Dietrich cast himself at the feet of his great ally, and made offer of his life because that the princes were slain. But Etzel raised him up, Dietrich he kissed, and they sat down together. So was their friendship made more enduring. When two summers went past the queen died. But ere life was taken from her she warned the king to wed not a wife from the land of the Nibelungs. Else, she said, thou and the children she may have shall suffer evil beyond concept. But the good queen's words were forgotten when Etzel sent envoys unto King Gunther, so that he might have Kriemhild for his bride. Now Dietrich and old Hildebrand had aforetime been friends of King Gunther and Hagen, and when the conflict was waged at Etzel's court, by reason of Kriemhild's evil doings, they did hold aloof, until impetuous Wolfhart was drawn into the fray. Then was old Hildebrand wounded, and all the knights of Dietrich were slain. Twas then, as hath been told, that Dietmar's great son took arms against Hagen and Gunther and overcame them. But when they were put to death, Hildebrand slew Kriemhild, whom he called a devil. Etzel said, A devil she hath been indeed. But for her many a noble knight would still be alive. Now be it told of how King Etzel passed from before men. Aldrian, Hagen's son, vowed to avenge his sire's death. So he paid visit unto Etzel and spake to him regarding the Nibelung treasure. If thou wilt accompany me, he said, I shall reveal to thee alone where the gold lies hidden. Etzel went forth. Hagen's son led him to a secret cave which is below the Rhine water. There he beheld vast treasure and his eyes were gladdened. But Aldrian stepped back suddenly and said, Now mayest thou have full enjoyment of the gold which thou didst desire, and I shall have vengeance for my sire's death. When he spake thus, Aldrian shut the door of the cave, and Etzel perished of hunger in that concealed and secure prison and the midst of all the treasure which he desired to obtain. So time went past, and then tidings came to Dietrich that Ermenrich had been slain by two princes, who avenged the death of Svanhild, and that Sebesh desired to sit upon the throne. He raised an army to march into his own kingdom, and old Hildebrand went with him. Rather would I die in Bern, Dietrich said, than remain any longer in exile even among the Huns. Chapter 42 The King's Homecoming The army of Huns Hildebrand and Hadjabrand The challenge Hildebrand identifies his son Hadjabrand's suspects treachery The combat tragic ending Dietrich as victory triumphant return to Bernsebesh slain the aged. King a deathless hero the wild huntsman. Now the length of time which Dietrich passed in exile was thirty and two years. He had never ceased to long to return again unto Bern. Hildebrand, who shared with him his sorrow, shared also his hope. He had waxed aged, and men tell that he had grown a century old, yet was he fierce in conflict as of yore, and wise as he was brave. When Dietrich, leading his army of Huns towards Bern, drew nigh to the northern frontier of the land of the Aemlungs, Hadjabrand came forth against him with a strong band. Then were the opposing forces drawn up in battle array. And it was fated that Dietrich should return alone unto Bern. Ere the battle began two brave knights rode forth from either army, challenging one another to single combat. Fearless and of noble seeming were they both. One was old Hildebrand. The other was Hadjabrand, his own son, who was but a babe when his father fared forth with Dietrich from Bern. Long had they been parted, now, at last, were they met, but to fight as foemen. Son and father had adjusted their armor with care. They were clad in coats of mail, their swords were girded over their armor when they rode into the fight. Hildebrand, Herobrand's son, spoke first when they drew nigh one to another. He was the older and the wiser man. Few were his words, but he asked. Who among men was thy sire? Which generation's child art thou? If thou wilt give me the name of but one of thy kinsmen, I shall know the others, all the nobles of the kingdom are known unto me. Hadjabrand answered, 
wise old men who died long ago were wont to tell me that my sire's name was Hildebrand. Mine own name is Hadjibrand. In years past Hildebrand fled eastward with Dietrich and many of his men. He left behind him, helpless and alone, his wife and his child, he left his own people behind. Dietrich had lost his sire, he had become a friendless man, and my sire hated Ermenrich that worthy hero. Hildebrand was wont to be with Dietrich a leader of the people, he loved warfare, well known was he indeed unto valiant men. I do not believe that any is still alive. Hildebrand was deeply moved, and he spake, saying, Now do I call to witness Ermin 123 the god of my people, that I dare not combat with thee, because that thou art so near of kin. As he spake the old hero took from his arm the twisted armlet of fine gold which Dietrich had given him. He held it towards his son, saying, This do I give unto thee for love's sake, Hadjibrand. The son advanced not to accept his father's proffered gift. He suspected treachery, so he spake, saying. A warrior must receive gifts with his spear when lance is against lance. Thou art an old and cunning hero. Fain wouldst thou entice me now with gentle speech. Thou wilt throw thy spear at me betimes. So old art thou grown and so cunning, that thou art become a hardened deceiver. Mournfully did Hildebrand shake his head. Seafarers have told me, his son protested, that they heard from the east of warfare above the Wendel Sea. 124, twas told them, Hildebrand, Herobrand's son, is dead. O ruling God! What fate is ours, cried Hildebrand. For thirty summers and thirty winters have I wandered as a fugitive. Ever went I into battle against the bowmen, nor would one of them give me my death. Now my own child will hew me with his sword or throw me down with his spear or else I shall be his murderer. In silence he gazed a moment upon his son, he regarded the noble form with sorrow and pride. Thou mayest easily win the fight with so old a man as I am he said, if thy strength is great. If thou dost triumph, thou shalt have my treasure for booty. Hajibran made answer with softer voice, for he had spoken harshly, I can see from thine armour, he said, that thou hast a good master. And methinks thou didst never become a fugitive by compulsion. Pleasant were the words of Hadjibrand in the ears of his sire. Hildebrand loved his son because that he was fearless and bold and thirsted for the fray. He could delay not meeting him any longer, lest he should be called a coward by friends and foemen alike. So he spake, saying, He who would deny thee combat now would be the worst of eastern men. Greatly dost thou covet glory. By common right of war this conflict should show forth today which of us can make boast among men. Then began they to fight. They tilted with their spears one against the other, but the heavy thrusts were parried by their shields. Ere long they drew their swords their hard-edged splitters and fearfully they hewed until, at length, their white shields were splintered and battered. They cast aside their broken bucklers. They fought then with their swords alone. Silence fell upon the opposing armies. No man spake. Every eye was turned upon the brave warriors in fierce conflict. Neither side was confident of the issue. Never before was Hildebrand so well matched. Never did Hadjibrand combat against so powerful a foeman. Long they fought, so that it seemed the conflict would never end. Then fell the last sword stroke. Sudden was its fall like lightning and as sure, and Hadjibrand sank upon the ground, bleeding from his death wound. Hildebrand flung his blade from him. He knelt beside the fallen hero. The stern old warrior wept bitter tears. Alas, he cried, I have slain mine own son. Hadjibrand, enduring sharp agony, looked up with death-bright eyes. Thou art, indeed, my sire, he said, no man save Hildebrand could have prevailed against me. Hildebrand wound his arms about the dying hero. Deathly white was his face like that of his son. Fate had stricken him sore. The battle began to be waged nigh unto him and went past. He spake not to the nobles who came near at eventide. The eyes of the fallen warrior were then glazed by death, his lips were cold, his armor was reddened by blood, Hadjibrand had died of his wounds. 
Hildebrand, Herobrand's son, had died of grief. Victory was won by Dietrich. His enemies were scattered before him, and those who were not slain fled unto their homes. But sad was Dietrich's heart when he rode in triumph into Bern because that old Hildebrand was dead. By the people he was received with great rejoicings, he went unto his palace. There did the nobles greet him and do him homage, laying at his feet gifts of gold and many gems. So was he acclaimed the rightful king. Sebesh sought in vain to stem the tide of victory which thereafter fell to Dietrich's arms. He marched against the king with a great army, he fought but a single battle. By a brave knight was he challenged to single combat, and after fierce and prolonged fighting he was cleft in twain. Thereafter was his army defeated, and those who survived the vengeance of Dietrich laid down their arms and did him homage. Then was Dietmar's great son exalted among men, for he was crowned king over all the dominions which her menrich had held. When Etzel died he was made king of the Huns also. Thus did he become the greatest monarch of his time he who had long been an exile from his own land. Long was the reign of King Dietrich, and there was peace over all the wide dominions which he ruled, for it was given unto him to be wise as he was powerful. To a great old age did he live. And minstrels, wandering from land to land to sing in the halls of heroes, have told that he never died. For it chanced that he went forth one day to hunt in a deep forest. Among the huntsmen there was none who was his equal even although he was burdened with years. He bathed himself, after the chase was ended, in a small lake. A dwarf came nigh and cried out. O king, the greatest stag which man hath ever looked upon is rushing past, it escapeth the huntsman. Dietrich left the water, he wrapped a rug about himself and called for his horse, but he was not heard. Then there burst through the trees a noble and high-stepping black steed. No man rode it. Dietrich sprang into the saddle, he urged it on, and the black steed ran faster than the wind. The dwarf rode behind him, swiftly indeed thou dost ride, he cried, when wilt thou return, O king? Dietrich made answer, I can hold not back this evil steed, nor can I dismount from it. Nor can I return again until it is the will of God and the Holy Mary. So Dietrich vanished from sight. And never more was he seen among men. Yet when the wind is high, and the world is tempest-stricken, the sound of hoofs are heard in mid-air, and men know then that Dietrich, seated on his black steed, is pursuing the stag as of old across the heaven's point 125.